we're going to um, make a start. So if you'd like to, to grab a seat, there's a few more people coming in, which is great. Um, but good morning and a really, really warm welcome to our morning service here at Christchurch. A particular welcome if you're here for Rory's um, baptism. It's lovely to have friends and family um, with us. We do have children's groups um, running. There'll be a little bit more information about those later, but we have children's groups and lasers happening after the service um, as normal. Also in our service, we'll be taking part in an annual act of remembrance for those who've died in conflict. But before we pray, let's just have a moment to pause. So a moment to pause, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Psalm 86 says, Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Heavenly Father, so often our hearts feel divided. We feel busy, worried, our hearts feel full. And we come to you this morning and we ask that you would turn our hearts again to you. Heavenly Father, we commit our time to you and we pray that we would grow in our faith and our awareness of you, that you would be at the center of our hearts and lives, that we would know you and fear you as you want us to. So we commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing um, now.
dwells in the presence of his people. Oh, how good it is on this journey we share to rejoice with the happy Afflicted find grace when we offer the blessing of belonging. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live out his word till the whole world sees. The Redeemer has come, for he dwells. As we stand, um, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you, the God of the universe, you dwell in the presence of your people. So thank you that even as we gather this morning, we can know your presence, that you are with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do take a seat. And John is going to come and lead us in prayer now. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. Um, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and if you'd like to make this prayer your own, then please join with me in saying amen at the end. Psalm 46 says, He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, and he shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. Dear Lord, today we remember all those people who have lost their lives in wars fighting for their country. We are thankful for the sacrifices of our country's servicemen and women, both past and present, and pray that their families would know comfort. We thank you that you have blessed us to live in a country and time of relative peace, but we remember also that war is sadly not a thing of the past. We pray for the peoples of Ukraine, Yemen, Ethiopia, and all other countries who are currently experiencing ongoing wars, that they may soon know peace. Comfort those families who mourn the death of loved ones and inspire those in positions of power to seek out peaceful resolutions to their issues. Lord, we pray fervently that the day will soon come when you put an end to all wars and the earth will see you and know your peace. Psalm 91, we read, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. 
We lift up Rory to you today, Lord, on the day of his baptism. On this special occasion, we celebrate the promise that you made to us, that by loving and believing in Jesus, we are forgiven of all our sins and made new. Thank you for Chris and Jessica, that they know and love you and have committed to raising their sons to walk in your light. And thank you also for the friends and family who have joined us with this morning to celebrate this occasion. We pray that in time, Rory and Rupert will come to know you personally and be able to call Jesus their saviour. May Rory's family, friends, and we, his church family, help guide and encourage him in your ways as he grows. May he always know that you will love and protect him and that in you he will find salvation. In Matthew 11, we read, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to meet together each Sunday and worship you as one family. Thank you for your endless mercies and grace to us, your people. We rejoice to know that whatever loads we carry, you will make lighter. Whatever sadness we feel, feel you will make brighter. And whatever joy we know, you will multiply. We lift up the Carter family to you, Lord, and their ongoing work in the Chiang Mai community in Thailand. Thank you that you have filled them with faith and service to you. Please continue to bless them in their work and lift them up through hard times and easy. Thank you for the recent baptisms that have been performed in their church. We stand amazed at your power to reach hearts and minds around the world, regardless of culture and language barriers. We pray that our new brothers and sisters, young in their faith, will continue to grow in your love. Thank you also for our church, for Joel and for the rest of the leadership team here. Renew them and us each day, Lord, that we might better walk in your path and serve you in our lives. Bless us this week, Lord, so that as we return to work and school, we will be a light in dark places, knowing that the hard work has already been done by you. In Jesus' holy name we pray this. Amen. Uh, if you'd like to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer as well, you'll find it uh, on the service sheet in bold. I think it's also going to be up here behind me as well. So, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. John, thanks so much for reading. And let me add my welcome to Frankie's. If we've not met, my name's Joel, and I'm the minister here at Christchurch Wokingham. And particularly lovely to welcome the family, friends, and godparents of uh, Rory and Rupert and Chris and Jessica as well. And at this point, we're going to invite up Chris, Jessica, Rupert, potentially, uh, definitely Rory, <laughs> potentially Rupert, and godparents. So Chris, Jessica, Rupert, Rory, godparents, do come up. And maybe stand to my left. That's probably the easiest way of doing it choreographically. <laughs> Brilliant. So we've got, some, we've got some formal things to go through in the baptism itself in just a minute, but I thought it'd be a good opportunity just to meet, um, perhaps for the first time, Chris and Jessica, and find out a little bit in their own words before we get to the formal part, why they're bringing Rory for baptism. Um, so I don't know who's going to answer which question, but tell us um, who you are, if we've not met you, how long you've been at Christchurch, what do you spend your time doing? So use, use the mic. Um, so, um, this is Chris, I'm Jessica, we've been at Christchurch since um, 2020, um, and uh, we live in Woodley, we've really enjoyed being welcomed to the church family and um, all the support everyone's given us, um, especially with Rory being born, and all the food, that's been great, and since our house flooded as well, so everyone's been amazing, um, and in our sort of day jobs, I'm a GP and Chris is a transport planner, so yeah, that's about us. Uh, it's great to have been visiting the house with all new paint and new furniture the other week. Um, it, looks, it looks brilliant, so good job, guys. I know it's been a lot of work. Um, and Chris, tell us, why, why are you bringing Rory for, for baptism today? Sure. Well, um, we're here, I suppose, to declare as a, as a family and as a group that we are uh, part of both this local church family here in Christchurch and also of the global church family. And uh, so by bringing Rory to baptism... 
Uh, we're not making him a Christian today, but we are declaring that we are going to be bringing him up in a Christian way and that we uh, um, want to view him as part of the church family, uh, just in the same way that Rupert is uh, and the two of us as well. Excellent. Thanks, Faith. Um, well, there's a few things to say, which I'll give you these just in case you don't have them, just if you need one. There you go, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, the Lord Jesus said at the end of his earthly ministry, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Baptism is primarily something that God does for us. It acts as a sign of the Christian gospel, united with Jesus in his death and resurrection, washed clean from sin, and given the Holy Spirit as an eternal guarantee of our inheritance. It acts as a seal of the Christian gospel as well. In baptism, we see God's trustworthy promise to give all these blessings to anyone who receives them by faith. Being born into a Christian family is a significant privilege. Just as the children of God's uh, just as the children of God's people under the old covenant received the sign of circumcision. So it's right that the children of God under the new covenant receive the new covenant sign of baptism. From their earliest days, they have access to the means of grace, the Bible opened and taught, Christian encouragement at church, earnest prayer, the encouragement of Christian fellowship. As we read in Acts 2, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So the church family now is a moment for you. You'll see all there and then respond as it says behind me or on the seats. Faith is a gift of God to his people. In baptism, we have a sign that the Lord is adding to his church all those whom he calls. People of God, will you welcome Rory and uphold him in his new life in the church? With the help of God, we will. Parents and godparents, the church receives Rory with joy. Today we're trusting God for his growth in faith. Will you pray for him, draw him by your example into the community of faith, and walk with him in the way of Christ? With the help of God, we will. You speak for Rory today. Will you care for him and help him take his place within the life and worship of Christ's church? With the help of God, we will. In baptism, we have a sign that God calls us out of darkness and into his marvellous light. To follow Jesus means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore, parents and godparents, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? I reject them. Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? I renounce them. Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbour? I repent of them. Do you turn to Christ as Saviour? I return to Christ. Do you submit to Christ as Lord? I submit to Christ. Do you come to Christ the way, the truth, and the life? I come to Christ. Brothers and sisters, let's all of us affirm our common faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father who made the world? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Roy, this is not a good sign because you're already wriggling and your mum is holding you. So let's see how this goes. Me and my father, when we used to watch this, used to take bets on whether the child would cry or not. So it's totally okay. <laughs> Rory James Hilco, I baptise you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let's see if I can find my tissue. Why are you taking? Oh, 
Oh, the tissue's gone. I'm very sorry, Rory. I, oh, there it is. <laughs> Mummy, that might be helpful. Okay, yeah, <laughs> Let me just take. Rory, Christ claims you as his own. Receive the sign of the cross. Do not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Together, fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil, and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. Amen. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. We welcome you into the fellowship of faith. We are children of the same Heavenly Father. We welcome you. Let's give him a big round of applause. And we have, from the church family, we have just a little gift for Rory, which he may or may not find exciting at this point. <laughs> Rory, this is for you. <laughs> Rupert might find it a little bit more exciting. Um, guys, do you go and grab a seat. Well done. Chris and Jessica have invited family and friends to um, share lunch together in the building afterwards. Um, Jessica says there's plenty of food, so if you'd like to join them, um, you're very welcome. And there may be some kind of rearranging going on as we have tea and coffee, and as tables start to come out for bring and share lunch. That always happens after the service. It won't have escaped your notice that we're in a sixth form center. Um, so that requires a little bit of adjustment anyway. So don't feel, um, don't feel awkward about that. If there's stuff happening around you, we'd love to stick around afterwards um, to share refreshments and fellowship together. Excellent, we're going to sing. And Chris and Jessica asked for this song, a song about God's amazing grace. And um, this is what we're praying and longing that Rory would grow up to know, that God is a God who overflows with generous compassion and amazing grace. Let's stand and sing together. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing
take a seat. So in that final verse of that song, we sang of that future hope that Christians have, that one day we will live forever, perfectly in peace with God and with one another. But in the meantime, it's appropriate that we mourn the wars and the conflict around the world, and we remember those who have lost their lives. And we're going to do that now with many around the country. So in a minute, I'm going to invite you to stand. I'll say some introductory words. And do repeat after me those words. We will remember them. We'll then have a moment of silence. And then I'll pray um, to, to, to close our act of remembrance. So do please stand. Let us now remember before our Heavenly Father, the shepherd of souls, the giver of life everlasting, those who have died in war for our country and its cause. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Let me lead us in a prayer. O oh God of truth and justice, we hold before you those people who have died in active service. As we honor their courage and cherish their memory, may we put our faith in your future, for you are the source of life, peace, and hope, now and forever. Amen. We're going to stay standing and sing of that hope that we have in a God who is faithful, faithful to bring about that future one day and faithful to keep us going in faith in the meantime. So as the music starts, let's sing.
Do sit down. And we've come to our time in the service where children are going to leave for children's groups. So um, if children are aged between um, naught and four, um, head out of that door um, to Sparklers. And um, out of this door is any children um, reception age up to year six, and that's Comets. So we'll give parents just a minute. Oh, actually, no, let's pray for the children. Sorry. Let's pray. And then we'll um, give parents a minute to take the, them out. Father, we pray for the children's groups and the leaders of those groups that um, those precious children would know just how great your faithfulness is. Um, so we commit that time to you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Great. If children want to, um, to, to head away. Do chat amongst yourselves just for a moment while they do that. Brilliant. Okay, well, um, a short time in our service just for a few um, notices for church family. Um, shoe boxes, and this is the final call for any Christmas shoe boxes. Please make sure that you just leave them on the door, um, uh, on the table by the door, and we'll make sure that they get to the church centre um, tomorrow. Life groups begin again this week, evening life groups um, half after taking a break for the prayer meeting. Um, last week so life groups are back on and if you'd like to join a life group you're not part of one yet do chat to Joel um, a bit of advanced warning um, uh, for those um, uh, with teenagers um, years 10 upwards um, I say warning it's exciting we're doing a Christmas social for them and you'll be emailed some information about that as soon as possible it's hopefully going to be on Friday the 16th and we're going to push all the, bo the boat out for the teenagers. It's our second rooted event. If you remember, we did a rooted event in October. So Christmas social for the teenagers of all the four churches that we're um, in, in partnership with. Um, but our biggest um, notice for today is a reminder of the Hope Explored course that we're starting in a few weeks' time. And we've got a video about that now. There are few emotions more powerful than hope. It's a spark inside you that brings a smile to your lips, a light that shows on your face, a feeling that lifts your head and pulls you forward. 
These days, hope like that often feels hard to come by. Maybe you've experienced your share of disappointments, but real hope is what the Christian faith claims to offer. A joyful expectation for the future, based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. Hope Explored is a three session series for anyone who is looking for a hope worth having. Whatever you do or don't believe, this is your invitation to explore, to discuss, to question, to discover. This is Hope Explored. Wouldn't we long for our friends and our family and our neighbours to know that Christian hope? So do invite people along. We'll be starting Hope Explored in a few Tuesdays' time, and it'll be three Tuesday nights in the run-up to Christmas. Chat to Joel if you'd like the details. Linda is now going to come and read our Bible reading for us, and it's on page 1067, so perhaps you'd be turning that up, 1067, as she comes to read. Today's reading is taken from John chapter 4, verses 27 to 42, page 1067 of the Church Bibles. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, come. See a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labour. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. Thank you, Linda. Before Joel comes to, to preach, we're going to sing one um, song that just reminds us where our souls can really find rest in God's words and in God's character. So let's stand and sing together. and my reward. 
riches come and riches go, don't set your hearts upon them. The fields in hope in which I sow are harvested in Father, we praise you that you are our Redeemer, rescued us from darkness and death. We praise you that in Jesus' is light and life and love. Please might you show us, shine a light by your Spirit onto him. Might we see his wonderful face as we look at these verses. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you have a seat? Jim Carrey at the 2016 Golden Globes. He was, um, he was presenting an award and he said this. He said, I am two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey. You know, when I go to sleep at night, I'm not just a guy going to sleep. No, I'm two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey going to get some well-needed shut-eye. And when I dream, I don't just dream any old dream. No, sir, I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winner <laughs> actor Jim Carrey because... Then I would finally be enough, it would finally be true, and I could stop this terrible search for what I know ultimately won't fulfill me. Because then I would finally be enough, it would finally be true, and I could stop this terrible search for what I know ultimately won't fulfill me. And if you watch the video, he says it with a smile on his face, but if you listen to Jim Carrey talk, you'll know that's totally in character, what he makes of his own fame. How's your own search? for fulfillment going. If you've been with us the last few weeks, or perhaps you're visiting today, uh, in John's Gospel, Jesus has been shining a light on our hearts. He says we're all like existential sharks. We, we, we have to keep moving or we die. We have to keep searching and seeking and looking for what we think will ultimately satisfy us and fill us up, what will ultimately be enough. And last week, as we looked at John 4, Jesus said, look, only I can satisfy your deep, deep longing for love. Only me. Today we're thinking more about work and meaning and purpose. Because all of us are seeking fulfilment in work, whether paid or otherwise. Maybe like Jim Carrey, we long for recognition and credit. And we probably won't get it at Golden Globes, but we long to get it elsewhere. Maybe we just want the satisfaction of a job well done. Maybe the joy, and we're very privileged, because the joy of the work itself is its own reward, and we find fulfillment in the things that we do. Maybe it's the feeling that we've done something that matters, that makes a difference, that does good in the world. And that is right, because we are made to work. Right at the beginning of the Bible story, God creates the first human beings and puts them in a garden to work it and take care of it. Work is good. I may have sung the hard-fi song Living for the Weekend over and over and over again in my early 20s, 
And that may or may not be true of our experience, but we know that is a very shallow way of living, don't we? Unending rest and the limitless pursuit of pleasure. We know that dehumanizes us because we know that work, paid or otherwise, we know that work is deeply foundational to what it means to be a human being. We know that work is good. So as Rory grows up, for instance, we long that Rory would find something to give himself to that would satisfy him and fulfill him in all sorts of ways. That's why we want him to be well-educated and find a job or career that means he can do good in the world and find pleasure and enjoyment in it. But some of us, perhaps particularly those of us who are older, know the problem. The problem well articulated by Freeman in The Wire, and The Wire is a brilliant TV series uh, made a few years ago, about a detective department in Baltimore. Um, and Jimmy is a police detective, and so is Freeman. And Freeman walks in on Jimmy in the office on a Sunday. And Jimmy's working, he never stops working. And Freeman, the world-weary older cop, dispensing some advice to his younger colleague, says, the job will not save you, Jimmy. It won't make you whole. It won't fill your ass up. Sorry, I can't do the American accent. It won't fill your ass up. It won't make you whole. And some of us, some of us know the truth of that very deeply, which is in stark contrast to the Jesus we meet in John 4, the one who was filled up by the work that he did. And he, in this passage, invites us to join him in the labour, the only labour that will ultimately satisfy us. So we're going to look at the work that satisfies Jesus, and then his invitation to join him in the work, the only work that will satisfy us. So firstly, the work that satisfies Jesus. We're jumping back into the conversation that started in John 4 between this Samaritan woman at a well and Jesus. And his disciples have been off trying to find some food for lunch, but they get back and they, they kind of butt in, they kind of rejoin this conversation. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Jesus is, as John has been telling us, the bridegroom, and the well is the kind of ancient equivalent in some ways of a dating app. And so it's a bit like the disciples have walked in on Jesus having a conversation with someone on a dating app in today's world, and they think, what is Jesus looking for? They ask the question, is Jesus looking for a spouse? He's the bridegroom at a well, that's where you go to meet your spouse in the ancient world. What is, what is Jesus looking for? It's... Um, uh, it, it, it's awkward for them, though, so they don't, they don't ask the question. Um, it's easier just to kind of take um, shelter in, in what, to, uh, what they're eating. Um, so verse 31, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. That's a, that's a safer thing to talk about. Um, uh, Jesus, Jesus um, says, verse 32, I have food to eat that you know nothing about, which predictably for the disciples, that they didn't get what he means. Um, so they enter into a kind of little bit of a sort of bickering conversation about who gave him food. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And Andrew's like, Peter, have you given him food? And Peter's like, Andrew, you're the one that's getting the food. Who could give him the food? And Jesus says, no, no you, don't, you, don't, you don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a very different sort of food. Verse 34, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I've got work that fills me up, in effect, Jesus says. It's work from my Father. The Father is seeking worshippers. We saw that last week. The Father is seeking worshippers, and he sent me into this world to find worshippers who will bow the knee to God and worship him in spirit and truth. I'm the bridegroom. And my father has sent me looking for a bride to find and woo and win. And that is the Samaritan woman and the Samaritans doing that work of winning this group of people to myself. That is the work that fills me up. And even as he says that, the Samaritan woman has gone back to the town and is telling them, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Verse 29. Could this be the Messiah? That would probably have been a very big surprise 
to Jesus' disciples. Because what would Jesus, what would God Almighty want with this Samaritan woman? Firstly, Samaritan, a kind of Mongol race in the eyes of the Jews, totally at enmity with each other. Secondly, a woman in a world where women weren't valued. And thirdly, a woman who's had five husbands in a deeply socially conservative culture. And yet Jesus the bridegroom wants to find a bride like her and like those people. He does want them. He does want her, which is a marvellous thing, but a thing that the church has often done a terrible job of communicating. An awful job. The so-called church has sometimes given a radically different impression that the sorts of people God wants is together people, sorted people, successful people, rich people, moral people, whereas the people that Jesus goes looking for are broken and messed up and know it in all sorts of different ways. Let me give you a tragic example of this. Um, there was a woman who had um, single parents doing a great job of looking after her kids, but multiple kids from different partners, um, and didn't have any clue about Christianity, grew up in a very conservative cultural place, um, very kind of churchy sort of place, but wasn't a Christian herself. And then she met some Christians who loved her and, and befriended her, um, and they really wanted to take her to church, and so they happened to be in the same town together one Sunday morning, um, and, they went, and they went to church. They'd never been to this church before, they went to this so-called church, uh, and the pastor was, was speaking about um, sexual immorality, very culturally conservative kind of place, um, speaking about the kind of the, the evils and the wickedness of sexual immorality and the, and the perils of the sexual revolution. Um, in, in some ways, that's not an, an overly uh, a unique thing to Christians. Um, this secular feminist, Louise Perry, has just written a book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Um, it's, not a, it's not just the case that Christians would say that sort of thing, but this pastor was saying it um, in a very uh, well, a horrible way, way, frankly, very ugly. He, um, he gave a rose out as he was talking about this, and the rose went around the whole congregation. And you can imagine as the rose went around, people absentmindedly kind of picking at the leaves, um, not really thinking about what they were doing, um, just like this. And over the course of the time, the rose went all the way around the congregation, and it came back, came back to the pastor. And the pastor held up the rose, and he said, who'd want a rose like that? And you get the picture, right? But that is a wicked thing for a pastor to say who's meant to be passing on the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Because the answer is, Jesus would. Jesus would. Jesus wants the rose. He comes into the world and goes looking in the place he'd least expect. The place that religious people wouldn't have him go. His food, the thing that fills him up, makes him whole, is finding unlikely people and making them his bride. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing, and it's, it's very different to our own human hearts. There's a poem called George, by George Herbert called Love, and the poem begins like this. You might know the poem. Love bade me welcome, but my soul drew back. To be loved like this unconditionally, immensely, to be loved like this, something in our human heart says that couldn't possibly be true of me. But Jesus wants the rose. His food is to find sinners and bring them to himself. That is what fills him up. In passionate, in passionate pursuit, he came looking for you, if you're a Christian. In beautiful tenderness, he won your heart and wooed you. And in self-sacrificial love, he thirsted at Calvary so that you never would. He is no reluctant worker. He bounces into the workplace. He doesn't take overly long lunches because he just can't face going back to the desk. He doesn't dread Monday mornings. His heart doesn't sink at the thought of his to-do list, which is left on a post-it note on his desk. Of all that the eternal creator could have given himself to, he gave himself to finding people for himself to be his bride forever. That is why when Chris and Jessica think about Rory and also Rufa, I know that their desire is for so many things for Rory, to grow up, to love the world, and to learn lots at school, and to get good qualifications so he could go and do a degree where he wants, perhaps. 
to then be able to have the world open to him and decide what to give himself to in the world and to find someone who will love him and maybe to marry and maybe to settle down and maybe to buy a house and maybe to have a few children and to have a happy and fulfilled life. Deep longings for our children. But I know their deepest longing is they would meet the love of the bridegroom. The one who loves Rory and loved him to the grave. It's why Christian believers, if you don't really understand why Christian believers want to tell other people about Jesus, this is why. Because the Christian has no right to give the impression that Jesus doesn't want to find and woo and win people to himself. No right to give that impression. And so yes, Christians tell people about the bridegroom who's looking for a bride. That is the work that satisfied Jesus. That is the food to eat that they knew nothing about. And it's the work that he invites us to join him in. So this is the second point. Jesus' work, only Jesus' work, satisfies our longing for meaning. Let me read verse 35 to 38. Don't you have a saying, says Jesus? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. When he says lift up your eyes, I think he means literally lift up your eyes and see these townspeople from this Samaritan town coming towards us. They're coming, and they're the literal harvest. Um, harvest is an appropriate metaphor for Jesus to use in an agricultural society. I suspect it's, um, it's slightly harder for us to get our head around. It's one of the reasons I loved Jeremy Clarkson's The Farm on Amazon, um, because you see Jeremy Clarkson, that very unlikely farmer, um, rejoice in birthing lambs and rejoice in the harvest coming in, and he harvests his potatoes, and then with childlike glee, he says, I did a thing, and it's cool, he grew stuff. And it may just be me, given my line of work, but if you have the sort of job which involves lots of meetings and lots of virtual things and data and and maybe um, spreadsheets and people, um, nothing very tangible at the end of your work day, you can see, can't you, why a harvest, actual fruit and vegetables at the end of your workday might be a very satisfying thing. <laughs> Kirsty's looking at me, he, um, at least one of the things she's done in her past is training people, personal training, and she evidently doesn't see the fruits of her labor very often. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was mean. Um, and Jesus uses the harvest as a picture because the fruit isn't fruit or potatoes the fruit is people the fruit is people coming in to the family bringing in the harvest or bringing people into the family of God helping people become for themselves the bride of Christ the people might become the worshippers the father is seeking and this work this sort of harvesting results in real joy and gladness So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Verse 36. This is the sort of work that gives joy to the heart and excitement to the eyes and strength to the arms. This work fills up Jesus. And if it filled up the most fulfilled man who has ever lived, do you not think that it can fill you up too? Giving yourselves to this harvest field. Joining God in his very purposes that he has for the world. That is massive. That is massive because we increasingly live in a world where people don't have any sense of meaning or purpose. So 89%, according to one survey, 89% of young people apparently believe that life has no meaning or purpose. One 22-year-old said it like this. She said, we distract ourselves online with unimportant things. We're always being entertained. We have stopped looking at life and its deeper meaning and have instead immersed ourselves in a world where the big stuff people think about is how many likes they get on an Instagram post. 
Meanwhile, others, perhaps slightly older, are thinking they can find meaning and purpose in their careers. But it never quite seems to work itself out. Or those of us who are older have realised that work will never provide the meaning, fulfilment, satisfaction we want. So we're just trying to hold on until retirement. But this is a meaning, a work, a workplace, a harvest, which will last and really will fill and really will make us glad. And Jesus says, join me. Join this harvest field. Sow and reap and rejoice. It's why if you're a parent, appropriate to talk about parenting, given the baptism today, it's why if you're a parent, this labour for your children, they might grow up knowing they are loved by King Jesus. It's why it's very good, even the best sort of labour. No more meaningful labour than sowing and reaping with your own children. And the fruit is in our Lord's hands, but the labour is very significant. The world will say that in order to matter, you must do paid work. That's why I suspect mums or dads who are asked, what do you do? And the answer is they're full time with their kids. Will probably always say, I'm just a stay at home mum or stay at home dad. The Christian never needs to say just. Never. Because there is no more glorious or wonderful or important harvest field or labour or work than helping your kids see they're loved by the bridegroom of the universe. That's why there's no better work for your children to give themselves to as well. You want so much for them. We want so much for Rory, all the things I've already said. But there could be nothing better for any child than to grow up knowing they want to give themselves to this harvest fields and it is possible that if Rory in God's kindness grows up knowing the Lord Jesus as his saviour and his bridegroom he'll want other people to know about it and it is possible that will mean that Rory makes sacrificial and difficult decisions that are hard for Chris and Jessica mum dad I'm thinking about moving to a different country or continent and it is tragically true that sometimes Christian parents hear their kids talk like that or mum, dad, I'm thinking about working for a church when I graduate. Or mum, dad, I'm thinking about going overseas for a bit of time. And they think, oh, what a waste. What a waste, because you just did a medical degree. You'd be a fantastic lawyer. God forbid any of us ever think like that. Because this harvest field filled Jesus up. This harvest field is the most important thing there is in the world. But for all of us, whether we're parents or not, in the relationships we have with our neighbours and our family and our colleagues and our friends and our acquaintances, if we're Christian believers, I know not all of us are, but if we're Christian believers, do we remember that we really are workers in a harvest field? And are we rejoicing in that labour? I suspect for lots of us there's a lot more sowing than reaping. But are we rejoicing in that harvest field? if we're close to retirement or have reached that point, do we know that it's not ultimately a time for unending pleasure? And I hope retirement includes lots of that. But do we know that ultimately it's a redeployment to a different part of the harvest fields? And when we think about church, I hope there's all sorts of things we're members of Christchurch that we love about it. There's certainly true of me, community and family and support. But do we know that as well as all those things, we are workers, we are co-laborers together, we have a purpose, we have a task in this world and in this town. President Kennedy was once um, touring the NASA facility um, before we, the Americans put a man on the moon and he met a janitor, very obviously a janitor in overalls um, and in the toilets, very obviously a janitor. And he said, oh, what, what do you do here, sir? And the janitor said, Mr. Kennedy, I'm putting a man on the moon. It's amazing that, isn't it, for the janitor to know their work had such meaning and purpose, they tied it to the very thing they were aiming for. 
The Christian believer, whatever the Christian believer does to serve the Lord Jesus in this world, the Christian believer is putting humanity into eternity. There is nothing more significant, nothing at all. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for the Lord Jesus who wants us, who died to win us. We praise you that seeking us and saving us is the work that fills his heart. It is his very heart. It is the passion of his life. And we praise you in a world that's increasingly starved for purpose. We praise you that he invites us to join him and join in. In his name, amen. Brilliant. Well, our final song echoes that longing and that prayer of Christian believers throughout history that God's kingdom would come, that good news of Jesus who wants the rose, that God's kingdom would come and that we would be part of it coming. So let's stand and sing together. prayer as we stand 
to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. And a reminder, do stay for coffee and tea if you can. Um, and if you'd like to share in lunch with Chris and Jessica and their friends and family, then do please stay for that as well. Thank you very much.